We are now in the panel discussion portion <laughs> of the program. Um, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions to kick it off, but I am then going to put the pressure on the audience to come up with questions, especially since we didn't have a, a kind of built-in Q&A during the talk. So, um, you know, this is your like five-minute window to prepare your questions, and we'll be sorely disappointed if you don't ask many. Um, maybe to start things off, like one interesting contrast in your talks is, um, Carrie, you took this kind of line of the sort of work backwards line of like, what's the problem? Start there. And Tristan, you've done a lot of work of that flavor, you know, certainly in your PhD, although a lot of the work you're doing now is sort of coming from the other angle of the general capabilities, and which in NLP I think is often something that is not necessarily specific to a particular task, but coming up with things like large scale resources, clinical embeddings, these sorts of things. So maybe you could speak a little bit about the role of those two sort of perspectives, uh, the, the general capabilities and the orientation, how you balance it, or, you know, I guess from, from your side, um, you know, maybe where you're coming from your side, sort of like how you stay grounded in the clinical problem when you're, when you're operating in like the, the general resources land. So whoever wants to jump in first. I don't mind jumping in. Yeah. I mean, I would say one lesson I've learned is you can't let perfection be the enemy of good. Sometimes there, there are always gonna be a better way of doing it, right? And actually NLP is a fantastic example. I would love to incorporate NLP into every model that I develop, right? I think it's very sophisticated, particularly for example, right now we're trying to develop, um, again in partnership with DHI, a model to predict behavioral emergencies in the hospital. Um, so these are patients who have psychiatric um, or agitation periods in the hospital. It turns out that there's very few data elements in the EHR that, that can accurately be used to help predict that. And I think a lot of, anecdotally, a lot of the predictors that I see actually would pick, be picked up by NLP. It's comments in the notes from nurses or providers using keywords such as agitation, delirium, confusion, et cetera, violence. Um, however, I don't have the capability at this point to do NLP, so you have to look at what are the options that you have available and start with the first best solution, knowing that a year from now, two years from now, there may be a better solution, but what's the option that's available right now if it's a pressing clinical problem? Um, you know, I think sometimes we, we try to get the best possible solution that has the highest area under the curve, but if it's a pressing solution, you need to go with whatever is available and easiest to build. Um, I can also say news, the reason we went with news, we didn't anticipate that it was gonna be a perfect solution, but it was easy to build into Epic back in 2014. Um, and so we went with that particular solution. So, you know, I just, I think about that a lot, even in my clinical practice, right, talking to patients, we don't, have the option for perfection at all times, and if it's a pressing enough need, we have to go with whatever we have available. Yeah, and I think, so, um, maybe to um, identify like a different set of users almost. So I, I think, uh, as you had mentioned, a lot of the work that I've done is, is directly with a lot, of, a lot of clinicians, and I think that's uh, both incredibly important, and also if you just start directly from like the technical standpoint, and then try to, give it to someone who's going to use it, uh, often an extraordinarily humbling experience because uh, I, I, I've always really liked, uh, like Nigam Shah's characterization of type three error is when you create this model that's like nearly perfect, but completely unnecessary. Like you just don't even, there's no use for it. Um, so I, I think in a lot of the work that we do, uh, we are still working really very closely with whoever is going to be using this in the end. Um, the way that I usually think about some of these like general resources for the broader NLP community is it's either to empower some of the other task specific things that we're doing downstream or more broadly to help push the community forward as well. And so the set of users that we're really trying to work with there are not necessarily the, the clinicians in the end, it's really who are all the people who are in turn helping clinicians So maybe like a degree removed and what, what resources can we provide that they can best utilize. And so there's a lot of feedback that we've, that we've received, you know, certainly on things like some of the, the large neural language models about, hey, can you just create one in this, this sort of subdomain or something like that? And, so, and sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes it's no, of course. Um, but really trying to focus on how is this gonna be used by whatever group it is that's actually gonna use it downstream. Yeah. Do you find it difficult to like back propagate all the way from like the, the end outcomes to what the people who are helping the clinicians seem to think they want, like 
to what you're providing? Like, yeah, I mean, I think there's a, um, it depends who you're working with, I guess, but because um, you, you know you could in turn also just be empowering the creation of a bunch of solutions that don't have a lot of downstream impact or meaning. Uh, and so hopefully, hopefully we're not doing that. But I, I, if I'm honest, I imagine we're doing a little bit of that, and then also hopefully a lot more of supporting the people who are actually trying to create meaningful solutions as well. Cool. And maybe one more question before we open things up. Um, so one thing that was striking, Kara, in your talk was that. Um, something that I spend a lot of time worrying about is the difference between making a prediction and providing some actionable guidance. And sepsis is a nice example because it's a case where like, if you've solved the detection piece, like you have some set of interventions. Like, if, if, I, if I detect it early, I know what to do with that. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of other predictive models that we've developed. Um, and I think all of us maybe in this room have developed that are of like a probabilistic nature where it's not quite as direct mm -hmm. what someone's supposed to do with it. So we say this person's at you know 10% higher risk of mortality than this other person, but we don't have this you know maybe anti-death remedies <laughs> you know as we do maybe mm -hmm. sepsis like prophylaxis or something. Mm -hmm. So what um, I, I guess there's I maybe mean, you could comment broadly on you know for some of these tasks. What does it necessarily even mean to implement the model when it's not clear what is the action that should be taken? Like, mm -hmm. is it just sort of surfacing this information to the doctor and looking to see do they end up getting better outcomes? Or like, how, how should we think about yeah. implementation when we don't know what the, this, the, we don't know the direct path from like prediction to clinical decision? That's a fantastic question. I actually love that question. So it's one of the issues that I've thought about a lot with mortality models in particular. So while it may not be clear that there is a single fix, uh, you know, it, something that take a pill and, and death is averted, right? But I think the fact that you have some sense of severity of illness or, or mortality does actually change the way the clinician is thinking about that patient. Um, so it may not be obvious that there's a single treatment or implementation, but just having that piece of information, right? It, it's part of what I was saying when I talked about your slide that shows the stacks and stacks of pub, PubMed papers. I think sometimes the goal of these models is just to digest all of that information and put it in a single form. You know, we may not appreciate that the patient has this problem and this problem, this problem, all independent, but when you put it all together and now it looks like, okay, there's 60% chance of mortality within a week or two weeks or two months. I mean, that does change how you think about the patient. It may change your conversations with that patient. The other thing that I think is really interesting to think about is, and, and deterioration is the other area I'm interested, like more global deterioration, right? So how do we predict which patients in the hospital are going to have a sudden cardiac arrest or sudden respiratory arrest? These are often kind of out of the blue occurrences. And to me, they shouldn't be, right? We have all of this data information, patients are continuously monitored. How can we not be able to identify who's going to have a cardiac arrest while they're in the hospital? But I think what's really interesting is not so much the prediction is what do you do about that? And so I think once you start to develop the model that predicts who's gonna have these events, then you can actually look at what, how does the care change for those patients that you predict have the event versus those that you don't and still have the event. Then you're actually looking at, okay, what's the treatment difference and what's the impact of that? So that's kind of the next, to me, the next phase of predictive models is to look at who's predicted to be high risk, who isn't, how do their outcomes change, and what are the differences in treatment for those two patient populations? Because then you're actually trying to figure out treatment strategies based on the model. I think maybe one of the things I really liked about your presentation was the the uh, the, the care taken to uh, the necessity of like change management and describing some of those uh, things to clinicians. I, I think one of the conversations I had, had yesterday with some folks here was about um, how when I put on my sort of my like data hat, um, what I'm essentially advocating for a lot of the time is can I come into your workplace and surveil you pervasively, um, and how if you did the same thing to me, I would probably have a lot of questions. Um, but you know, beyond that, especially if I'm not able to provide sort of a meaningful change or a meaningful suggestion for change, how that sort of is going to fall flat in a lot of cases. And so the, the process of explaining the importance and why it's important to do it now especially is, is really critical to actually having some, of the, having some of the adoption that we would like to see more broadly as well. Okay, you've been warned and now you will be forthcoming. And we have a volunteer here in the front. Maybe for the benefit of uh, people on the internet. I'm, 
I'm Steve Conrad from LSU in Shreveport. I have a very simple question about the role of the two nurses that you described. Were they on the helping to facilitate use of the model, or were they involved in facilitating things if the model predicted something positive? Yeah, so actually, importantly, both. So they actually helped in generating how the model was constructed and implemented, and then they are the end users. So they're actually the folks. That's a picture of them out rounding on the units using the model. They use it on an iPad um, to go identify patients who are at risk and then make clinical interventions. Um, cool. Uh, hi, thank you both for your awesome talks. Uh, really appreciated it. Um, yeah, I think Sepsis Watch is one of the coolest and sort of most successful case studies I've heard come out of our community at MLHC. And so my initial question was going to be, like, how can we, uh, you know, integrate more AI into, into clinics and all of this? But then you, you sort of talked about before you met DHI, you were already trying these various scores and stuff like that. So I started thinking maybe there's, like, thousands of Keras out there, like, and we're just not talking to them and not learning from them. So maybe a better question might be, like, how can we learn from them and how can we work from them uh, if, you know, all these people are out there. Like, probably, presumably, they're just trying to save lives rather than, like, come here and talk to us. So, mm -hmm. you know, how can we get more Sepsis Watch-like case studies? Um, yeah, that's a, it's a great question. And I guess by way of background, I am actually an um, applied math major. Um, and grew up in an environment where I thought about predictive modeling um, as, as a background. So I think it comes to me a little bit more intuitively maybe than a lot of other um, providers. But I do think sort of showcasing examples. So the, the photo that was um, shown next to the two nurses in the red coats is actually stolen from the um, article that was written about us um, in the Wall Street Journal about Sepsis Watch. And so it's kind of out there in the public. And I think sort of publicizing success efforts where AI tools have been used and have real clinical impact, honestly, to the lay public and, and in some of the journals that busy clinicians read regularly is probably the best way to do that. Um, you know, I think we all know that there's too many papers to read. There's too much data coming out. But really seeing, honing in on success stories where models um, impact patient care is, is what's most important. Um, and I think, honestly, some of this is going to be driven by patients, right? So everybody has a smartwatch. Everybody has smart devices now. They're looking for ways to, to get this data integrated into their own healthcare plans. And so they're coming to us with, hey, I noticed on my watch, you know, that I'm having a new irregular rhythm. Is this something that should be monitored, right? I think some of those solutions are going to be driven from the lay public um, coming to providers and saying, hey, we need some, some way to integrate this information in, in digestible forms in my own healthcare. Well, we have, uh, over here, and then we have a couple in the back. Thank you both for your talks, Dan Adler. I'm a PhD student at Cornell, and um, I don't, I don't know if the output is sepsis watch. It looks like it's just a prediction of sepsis. I'm curious. We've had a lot of posters and talks on interpretability and explainability. I'm curious how much of that was a factor in implementing sepsis watch. Do you hear clinicians want that? Is there tension when things go wrong? And then a comment on the NLP side. I'm curious from the answer and how you think about this in your research. Thank you. I was actually going to devote a slide to that. Um, so especially around. Um, physician autonomy. So in general, clinicians want to know why a particular patient's risk is elevated or low, what's actually driving that risk. And I think one of the biggest challenges we actually face with implementation of sepsis watch is the fact that it's a black box model. Um, and even explaining what a black box model is a foreign concept to a lot of clinicians. So it goes back into building trust. And so what I found was most effective was rather than try to explain what a black box model is, how I can't explain for a given patient what the individual driver was, was for that patient's risk. What I can show is cases where this, this model implementing made a difference in the patient's care. Um, and so gaining that trust in the model itself, really on a case-by-case -case basis, shift by shift with some of the key ED leadership, ED providers, um, and then that trust then disseminated to other ED providers, other clinicians. But it is a huge issue, and I think as we think through uh, putting these models into practice, figuring out ways to explain the model, how it generates its output, what it means to be black box, um, and developing mechanisms to build trust with clinicians is a key aspect. And I'm not saying I have a perfect answer for that, because I continue to struggle with how to do that as we develop and implement new models. Uh, providers just want to know, hey, what, what's driving this risk? And sometimes you can't really figure that out. 
how do you actually say, hey, trust this, or you know, here's how you can validate this, or here's how we did validate that. How do you explain that in a digestible fashion to, again, really busy frontline providers, I think is, is, is a fantastic question. I'm gonna look to you all to help figure out how do we actually do that uh, at the front lines. So I think they're very much linked. So I think tr provider trust comes from explainability. If we can understand pathophysiologically why this model is projecting the risk risk, we'll have trust in it. I think so on the NLP side, maybe we'll add is I, I think a while back I had sort of separated out for myself the difference between interpretability, like something being innately interpretable and being explainable after the fact. Um, and I, I sort of did that in part because of a, a, a long running series of interactions with some other folks at NSR where I, uh, ask them about the interpretability tools that they were creating and um, the sort of running joke was I would walk in and say, does it work for NLP yet? And they'd say, well, not yet. And I'd turn around and walk back out. Um, and, and that's not to say there, there are some incredible tools that have been developed for you know, probing NLP models and, and trying to get to better interpretability there as well. Um, but I do really like, uh, there, there was a, a clinician uh, from Ahavit Sick Kids named Pierre Lawson, who's I think now moved to somewhere else, but he had sort of had this really nice description of himself as a black box, and he was describing how, like as a clinician, you actually don't know why he made the decision either. Um, you might think you do because of like a shared background or sort of overlapping specialization or something like that, but you don't actually know why he made the decision he did in the care setting. The, the big difference between the model in a lot of cases and, and him is that you can sort of probe and ask questions and try to establish why was that decision made. And so I think that, that drew for me at least quite a bit of importance around, even if it is post hoc, being able to rationalize some of the decisions that have been be made by these models is another mechanism for, for building trust in, the, in what the model's doing. It's a fantastic analogy, you might steal that. Yeah, it's not, well I stole it, so it's not, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you both for very interesting and insightful talks and uh, I'm actually thinking just, you know, uh, linking the two, you know, perspectives or two stories together, you know, on the one hand, we do have something like more like a clinical problems. And then, you know, on the other hand, we have some you know, interesting tools. Clearly, like, you know, we have seen that, you know, the NLP models are now uh, sophisticated enough, they can actually, you know, get very good results with, you know, complicated biological concepts or clinical concepts and uh, with the you know, part line verb models. And uh, on the clinical side, you know, just, Thinking back to you know my intern years, you know when you're, you know overnight on a call have you know emissions or emissions, then it was great to have a model that can help extract you know all the past medical histories or you know the, the medications and everything right. But what I can see that there is you know a you know probably there's a barrier in between which is the EHR system. They are you know owned by these large you know corporations that don't that have a different business model. It's not open to you know these sort of uh, incorporating these new tools. And I was wondering, you know, from both of your perspective, in terms of you know whether there is a way to actually bring these you know you know great methods uh, tools into you know an EHR system, and uh, you know, whether there's a way to sort of get around that barrier. Yeah. So maybe I'll start. I, I think um, one of the things that's been pretty exciting about where I am now is that we get to work with a lot of other um, providers and uh, like IDMs and things like that that have pretty significant capacity for instrumenting change on site as well. Um, that said, I, I think there's some truth to what you said about, you know, th there might be some resistance from whatever other provider, you know, whatever other services they're, they're using uh, locally to incorporate some of these, these tools as well. Um, there's, there's a couple of different ways around that. So one of them is like just sidestep the existing tools, target a set of meaningful tasks that are maybe like operational in nature and don't necessarily touch directly on some of the like point of care tooling. I, I think that's often pretty unsatisfying because I think what we'd like to do is, is help uh, affect change in a lot of these care settings and, and lead to sort of better, better decisions overall in a lot of cases as well. I, I think one of the, the other tensions that you sort of alluded to is much of the time we're asking people, you know, we, there, there's a tension to how much you can ask people to provide at point of care with respect to um, like reporting burden. And, and I think ideally, and, and some of the most exciting tools, I think when, I'm, when I've talked to various clinicians about them are the things that actually aim to reduce that reporting burden. So the types of things where you know, you're looking at the, the course of a patient encounter and you're 
automatically creating some of the underlying summarization of that encounter. Like that, that's a really exciting thing because it's you know, taking what is previously like a generation task and maybe turning it into a validation task where they're just going through and saying, yes, we discussed this or no, we didn't. Um, and it's also empowering for patients on the other side because if they can see that same summary, they also get a say in, I, I remember this being discussed or maybe I don't remember it being discussed. Um, so I think there's, there's a, a couple of different ways you can do it. There's, there's a lot of levers you can sort of turn, but I, I think honestly in the end, it, it usually just ends up being finding the, the right collaborators to work with and, and the right people who are, who are willing to make some of those changes. I think an aspect of the question that maybe I misheard, but was partially about these large EHR vendors, like how do we get them to start incorporating some of these tools? And I think, you know, ultimately they're business models, right? And so they want to be bought by large healthcare systems. Healthcare systems want to buy models that improve either patient outcomes or efficiencies of care so that they can churn more patients through the system. So I think showing that these models, and this is, you know, obviously the 30,000 foot view, but showing that these models improve one of those outcomes to health systems is in the interest of these EHR vendors. You know, I think it's really interesting what's happened with Epic's sepsis model, right? So the, the, you know, it was obviously in place, it's being used by hundreds of health systems across the country, but it had never really been externally validated. It was developed in three hospitals, U Colorado, and then a couple other smaller hospitals. Um, and finally, you know, within the last couple months, it was published that when you look at external validation, again, in one system, Michigan, not a large system, but it performed horribly, right? Poor sensitivity, poor specificity, and largely was ineffective. Those patients that did identify as having sepsis were already being treated for sepsis. You know, and it's like a wake-up call to Epic and I think other large EHR vendors that, hey, actually creating models that are appropriately developed, externally validated, is crucial. And if you want your particular system to be bought by additional healthcare systems, which is, you know, goes to your bottom line, you have to develop models in a robust fashion uh, using the way you know, academic centers actually develop and, and validate models. So you know, I think that's, again, these like external validations of some of these private uh, models is really important. Um, and I do think companies are listening. Um, you know, there, there's been a ton of press with that single article published, um, and I think the public is also aware. There's like a, maybe let's jump in for a second. There's a couple different notions of external validity here. One is that there is someone external to the uh, set of people who stand to gain by promoting the model um, who's, you know, check the claims. But there's also, um, in this case, there's there's model that you say is developed in Colorado and a couple smaller hospitals being evaluated on a completely different population. And if I understand correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, about sepsis watch, that this is a model that was developed and is deployed on the same population. Mm -hmm. And in general, um, you know, there's no assurance that the model that's actually the right model for one population will be the right one for another. They're in different hospitals, but all kinds of things are different. Um, so I guess, um, among other questions, you know, maybe one that, I mean, maybe two that come up that are kind of natural here is one is for, for some of these things, should we be thinking about this as there's even hope for sort of a universal model, or is it really that the risk characteristics are gonna vary so much across institutions that there, this will have to be a somewhat bespoke enterprise? Mm -hmm. And even within a system, presumably, like the land is shifting under you, and so there's a question then of not just do we need different models um, across different locations, but also how do we need to think about model monitoring and sort of keeping models current as things are changing over time? love both of those questions, actually. And the first one is another area of interest of mine, and I would say I don't, I'm not gonna give you an answer because I don't know. So I think there are certain problems where there may be universal models or models that are more applicable um, across systems of care, but then I do think there are models that are more specific to individual sites of care. And I think the important aspect is just to take the model development technique and, and plop that into a different healthcare system and then look at what happens, right? Um, and that's, you know, a really interesting area of research. M my suspicion is for things like sepsis um, that there are likely to be individual drivers of, you know, risk of, of disease that we can't capture in our existing data that do make site specificity important. 
but I do think there are other models where that is going to be you know, less important. I think overall deterioration, just because it's a more global risk, I suspect you can probably take that from system to system and use the same exact model. Um, but I actually think that that is an, a really important area of research to figure out which models are actually going to need to be site specific versus those that maybe have more applicability across systems. Um, so that's your first question. The second one is about um, sort of model monitoring. Again, super area, area of interest of mine is how do you continue to monitor performance? How do you adjust the model? And I think that's a key aspect. You can't just kind of one and done a model and figure that you're, you're you know, good to go for the next few years or even necessarily next year, right? Healthcare systems change. I think sepsis is a ph phenomenal example of that because of COVID, right? So we implemented November of 2018, a year and a half later, we were presented with a huge population of patients who looked for all intents and purposes like they had sepsis, right? And they don't have sepsis. They don't need antibiotics. They need an entire different care plan. And how do you adjust that model that you was working so well for predicting based on, you know, now a new disease state that, that you have no experience with that was not included in your model development or validation. And so I think figuring out and, and having a mechanism to adjust your model's output um, is an absolutely crucial aspect of, of, you know, I think I take it as a responsibility as a lead clinician to understand what's the changing dynamics amongst uh, clinical care, amongst patient population. But I think that also has to be coupled with statistical support to look at the, the characteristics of the model over time. What are the changes in variables? What are the changes in population? Um, all of that needs to be looked at continuously. And you need to have a model in your system that actually continue, uh, continually you know, looks at those factors. Um. So I think maybe, or do we have a second? Okay, sure. yeah, so I think maybe just to, to add on to that, I, I think, um, you know, the, the way you would sort of frame the, the prior question is, uh, is like a, a business problem. I think there is actually, in addition to sort of the innate like research questions that are there, going to, there's gonna be tremendous business interest in how do we actually migrate models that were developed at one site to other sites, if only because there are a number of hospital systems that have grown through acquisition and some of the classic, you know, um, let's get people onto the same payroll, the same uh, EHR, the same et cetera, as sort of this like native system, that, that same question will arise with, hey, we've developed these, these models at our sort of native site, can we, transfer, can we transfer them to this, this new acquisition site? Um, there are many, many challenges there. Um, I actually, went, the, the clinical NLP uh, workshop, the, the second keynote was actually talking specifically about implementation and some of the difficulties and different types of um, challenges that arise with respect to patient population, with respect to just things changing over time, with respect to different care practices. Um, any, any, and, but I think it's, it's probably something where there will be substantial demand for um, trying to figure out how to do that as well. I, I think also, I mean, you, you know, if you sort of think about um, to, to the second question about like how do we actually deploy models and, and gather telemetry, there's, there's actually been a lot of work from this community, some of the people in this room even, um, about doing like silent deployments, deploy the model first, don't actually let it instrument, uh, you know, affect change at the point of care see how it performs and try to really get a robust understanding of how it's performing. But long term, um, especially for models that are then subsequently gathering new data from the point of care to improve themselves or sort of learning continuously, presumably we are putting one of these models into practice because we want to change some of the outcomes. And by nature of changing those outcomes, the future data that that model is going to see is going to be different than the data that it was originally trained on. And so there are a lot of questions about, you know, how do you manage that model over time during the course of the deployment, making sure that it retains the performance that you expect it to, rather than sort of see the innate degradation that you would otherwise expect from changing the underlying distribution of data that you're training on. Sawyer, I think probably have enough time for what, one more question. So who's going to include? I, was, I think our friend over here has had his hand up for a little while, so. Hi, uh, so this question um, is for both. So in terms of metrics, um, I wanna uh, understand more about how metrics at different levels, so the metrics that data scientists are interested in is different from metrics that clinicians at different levels are interested in, which are maybe different from the metrics that uh, the C-suite is interested in. So uh, can you talk about your journey with how you can use metrics to get um, 
something uh, to be uh, absorbed by a system. And similarly, in terms of N NLP, what metrics do you think could be useful or how you can use, how you can get um, these tools to be implemented in a healthcare system, uh, knowing that, you know, different, the, a the AUC scores is not gonna be uh, <laughs> enough to convince people. <laughs> Yeah, maybe maybe I'll start. I, I actually often love thinking about metrics and how and often many of their flaws. Um, I, I think even you know sort of comically with the NLP community, we we've, we've sort of um, like zeroed in on not like uh, area under the ROC curve, but area under precision recall or like F one sort of sort of these things around precision recall. And, and I think some of actually the initial challenges that I had had was I was very familiar with those metrics. Uh, and most clinicians are not, the, may, maybe one of them because it happens to be the same, but they're much more familiar with things like sensitivity and specificity. And so trying to do that translation of just, okay, I'm showing you a chart, like what does this even mean? Um, is, a, is sort of an initial barrier much of the time. I, I think what I have sort of come back to is, you know, you can use whatever metrics in development to sort of um, try to just improve the model and understand different pieces of a, a longer pipeline. But, but what really makes a difference in the end is some of these user studies where people are actually saying, yes, I, I see this, and I feel like it is actually helping me do this task, which, and there's a big gap between metrics and perception um, often. And so the, the real win is not so much um, just pushing, pushing up whatever metric you want. It's really getting the sense that this thing is actually helping me. Um, and and I, I call that out mostly because I might, for example, come up with some score where I'm, I'm completely satisfied, it's 80%, it's 30 points over what I had previously on, on you know, whatever my favorite metric is for this task. If it's a metric where 80% means it's like one out of five times it's getting something wrong, and somebody's actually using that, and they're using it really frequently, one out of five is really annoying. Uh, it's just like the type of thing where you, you start to use it and then you sort of throw it away because you think to yourself, like this is actually just, I'm spending so much time correcting it or doing whatever else. I think also for, you know, to that point really, having mechanisms to provide feedback can be really, even when something is not perfect, having a mechanism to provide feedback where the user can actually see that feedback being incorporated and you know, sees maybe even like the same example a future time where it gets it right because of that feedback is extremely powerful with respect to getting user buy-in and helping clinicians see, oh, you know, it's, it's not perfect at first, but we've had these past experiences working with them where it's not perfect at first and then it just gets better and better and better and now I can't imagine life without it. And, and I think, you know, uh, maybe as a summary, this is, there are tons of metrics, they're incredibly helpful for building models, but what we really care about is um, what is the actual, like, impact on a person in the end. I mean, I think I, that was a perfect response, and I completely agree, particularly with the end user feedback option and transparency around response. I think those are key for buy-in. But as far as developing the metrics, you know, I, I do think it's an important step before you start developing a model is to think through and actually interview even key stakeholders, right? So that's all the way from your statisticians, your model development, to your end users, to the patients impacted, to the C-suite. Figure out what do they care about, and then how do you kind of manipulate the problem to meet what they care about and what are the metrics that they want to know and actually figure out how to build those out because sometimes these metrics are really difficult to build out, right? Things like patient satisfaction or patient utility, really difficult to measure. So that's important. How do you figure out how to measure that in a way that you can, once you're implemented, actually report out, right? Or if it's clinician satisfaction or trust in the model, how do you know that you have that? How are you going to build that in so that you can actually report it out? Um, so I think it's really important to think, to ask your question actually before you even start with model development and certainly before implementation so that you figure out how to build out the structure to report on those metrics well in advance of actually building the model. Thank you. Um, so we could thank our panelists for their, their talks and for fielding all of our questions.